Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 11, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really mean it. We have a lot to get uh, to get done, a lot to get covered. So I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I had to simulate that um, Mountain Dew opening because uh, I got a little overzealous before the show, and I opened up the um, Mountain Dew prematurely. But uh, good stuff. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can't lose money trading. Or, as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. This is a part of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon.com. I'm not ashamed to ask for a review. If you like the book, of course, please put me up a review on Amazon. And the reason to do this, as I say almost every week, is because there are some malignant folk out there that review their reviews. Their reviews have nothing to do with the book itself, but they're reviewing what they think of the reviews. And a lot of people like the book, and they find it hard to believe that a lot of people like the book, because statistically, you shouldn't have that many good reviews. But I ask for reviews, so most of the reviews up there are from friendlies. And uh, I'm okay with a little criticism. There was um, one review, like a three-star, but because it was a lot of work. But I agree, it is a lot of work. But it's worth it. I think anything worth doing is worth, um, I guess, worth overdoing. I think Mick Jagger said that. Hey, what are we talk about? Um, question is, wider stops. Is there more risk when using wider stops? And I think my answer may surprise some of you. Um, the next question is, are volatile issues really more risky and again that might be a surprise answer for some of you we have another dead money report thank goodness and then uh, speaking of dead the IPO bull market is not dead yet so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, anything you want me to cover uh, please start uh, thinking about that now um, when we get to the wait until we get to the charts before you start asking about individual stocks and when you do, if you don't mind, just to, just for your benefit, ask about one stock and then hit carriage return or hit return, whatever you want to call that, enter. Uh, so I'll see just one stock per line. I'll answer um, as many as we could fit in in the show, but uh, put them one stop at a time. Someone just recently canceled my trading service, and this is the reason they gave me. Uh, it said stops are too wide at initial positions and therefore did not fit my risk tolerance. And my answer to that is that stops must be outside of the normal shorter term volatility. The amount of the stop does doesn't have to doesn't have anything to do with the risk because risk is fixed. You adjust the risk to the stop. If anything, tighter stops are more riskier because A, they are more likely to get hit in the first place, and B, you have to trade more shares to compensate for the lower volatility. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. This creates more risk should or when a larger than normal move occurs. In a more volatile stock, this is expected and has already been compensated for. In other words, or, or just to repeat that, it's, it's, if you have a wide stop and a volatile issue, you already have adjusted for the fact that this stock can make a larger than normal move compared to a less volatile stock. But that less volatile stock, there's no guarantee that it won't make a large move. And I'll flesh it out in just one second. Uh, I'll be happy to walk you through it. In fact, that's what we're doing today. Volatile issues with wide stops are actually less riskier than lower volatility issues with tight stops. Now, let me explain that to you. Um, I don't know if this was one of the examples that he was referring to. But I think it's a good current example because this one had an eight-point stop. Now, eight points seems like a lot, especially on a 40-something dollar stock. In fact, what's the math on that? I didn't do it ahead of time, but it's, uh, oh, it's uh, over 50%. It's about 18% round numbers on a stop. So that seems like a lot percentage-wise. But just look at the chart and eyeball the chart and notice that really the stop isn't even that far below the the low of the move, and this stock has made a fairly substantial move in its pullback from the high to the low over a very short period of time. So it's illustrated that it can make some pretty substantial moves over a fairly short period of time. So you have to adjust to the volatility accordingly. Now let's take a look 
at the spreadsheet. Okay. Now, assuming this stock, which had an entry of 44, okay, and we have, let's say we have a 100K account, nice round numbers, and we have 2%, we're going to risk 2% on every, every trade. So 2% of 100,000 is how much? $2,000, okay? So we're going to risk $2,000 on every trade. Now, if you had a one-point stop, you would trade 2,000 shares. By the way, if you want this spreadsheet and you can adjust it for your own use, uh, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to give it to you, okay? So it's very unlikely that we would trade a stock that would be so low in volatility that we'd have a one-point stop on a $44 share price, okay? But for academic purposes, for educational purposes, let's assume we did. Well, if you did, you would actually buy 2,000 shares of that stock. 2,000 divided by the risk, okay? So it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, the dollar amount divided by the risk, equals 2,000. Well, if you bought 2,000 shares of a $44 stock, that would require an $88,000 investment, or you would have to have margin to cover an $88,000 investment. Now, imagine if you had $88,000 in one particular stock on a $100,000 account, you'd have 88% of your stock of your account in that one stock. Yes, you might have a stop one point away, but let's say something bad happens overnight, okay, the impropriety of a CEO, which has happened on more than one occasion, but the, the one that sticks out to me was uh, in HPQ when uh, he had an inappropriate sexual relationship with a porn star who was uh, a contractor or something, and then he sexually harassed her too. So this normally not volatile stock tripled in volatility overnight and made a, a huge overnight type of move. So you lose a lot more than just $1 on a move like that. And as you can see, as your stop increases in size, what happens is the number of shares decreases in size, okay? And then your percent of the account that that stock represents decreases in size. So let's say that this stock gets halved overnight because of something stupid, which has nothing to do with the company itself or whatever, maybe a bad reflection on the company, then you could lose 44% of your account. Well, let's say this, this stock gets halved overnight and your initial position is only 11%. Well, you're down about 5.5%, okay, if you lose half of that um, amount overnight. Now, it's still a big chunk of change. Don't get me wrong. Okay, what we're doing is risky. We get paid to take risk, but by adjusting to the volatility of the instrument, in this particular case, eight points, because look, I mean, eight points is really not that much. This is your entry here. This is the stop, which really isn't that far away from that low, okay? So that's not much when you consider the normal volatility of the stock, but by Having it adjusted to the normal volatility of stock, notice that your share size drops down to only 250 shares, which is still substantial. It's still 11%, okay, of a 100K account. But if this thing gets whacked overnight, you're still going to live. You're still going to be able to, uh, you're not going to be out of business as a trader. And hopefully another winner will come along fairly quickly to allow you to make up for that. That's one thing I can guarantee. Sooner or later, you will get whacked in this business, and it will happen more than once over your career. But if you practice proper money management throughout your career, you'll do just fine, money and position management. Let me fix something here. Okay. So wider stops aren't necessarily bigger risk. In fact, wider stops actually give you less risk, and that is because you are compensating for risk by reducing your share price. Jonathan says, is that part of the CEO package? Package, wink, wink. <laughs> yeah, I guess so in some cases, huh? Okay, stops and volatility. Um, 
In spite of a popular method that uses the fixed stop, there is no one-size-fits-all. And I tell the story quite often. I was speaking in San Francisco a couple of years back, and somebody raised their hand, and they, and they, they were just, like, uh, appalled that I had a 20% stop in a stock that required it. Something like, you know, let's just go back to this one more time. This is, like, an 18% stop. But it requires an 18% stop. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit. We'll come back to this in a few minutes and talk about taking a little heat on a position uh, when we get to the dead money report. So anyway, this one gentleman began to argue with me, and he was saying that well, I should only use an 8% stop no matter what the stock is. Well, some of these little biotech companies that we trade or solar stocks or whatever, um, they could move that amount in one day. In fact, uh, that particular stock had a pretty good move. I don't know what this move was here. I think it was, um, let's say, around 44 to 52 at least. So that's um, 52 minus 44 equals, that's 8 points divided by 44 equals, so that's 18%. So this one particular stock moves 18% and, or as you can see, it moved 18% in one day. So saying that you should use an 8% stop, S-T-O-P, on every stock, S-T-O-C-K, is like saying that all of us should wear a medium-sized shirt, okay? And as I've said before, depending on the designer, I might go up to a triple XL, okay? So I'd be, I look pretty stupid. I look like a sausage in a uh, medium shirt. I almost, I almost found a medium shirt and put it on. It took a picture of me, but... Um, a chicken out at the last minute, so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say I won't ever do that for for a laugh or for entertainment purposes, but um, who knows? But anyway, that's like saying that you should use the same stop, and everyone is saying that one size fits all, and one size does not fit all. Uh, too tight of stops will all but guarantee you a loss if your stop is within the normal volatility of the instrument that you are trading. For instance. We just saw that stock moved 18% in one day. If you had an 8% stop in that, you're probably going to get stopped out probably long before it has that move in your favor because it seems like more often than not, at least over the last 10 years or so, or maybe even 15 years, ever since uh, the bull market, the big bull market in 99 ended in early 2000, in March 2000, seems like positions back and fill a little bit more, or certainly more than they did back then. They just went straight up back then. Now they kind of back and fill. Now it's like every other week it seems like I'm giving you a dead money report, preaching and teaching that you must wait and let things develop as opposed to micromanaging yourself out of these positions. So I can all but guarantee you're going to get stopped out with tight stops. Now, I know some of you, your eyes will glaze over at this, but just bear with me. I have fixed a lot of people, and I haven't made a dime in fixing them. But it is kind of rewarding knowing that I've helped some people out there. And that's one thing I really love about what I do is I do get to help people. And I fix a lot of people by just having them loosen up their stops. As I say, ad nauseum. You know, we've had a couple of people. One was 19, one was 20, one was 21 in more recent times. They've gotten stopped out 21 times in a row. Well, either their stops are too tight or their stock picking is really, really bad or some combination thereof. But I have helped a lot of people and just said, just loosen your stops up. And once you loosen your stops up to the appropriate amount, you'll start catching more and more and more trends. And we've had quite a few big winners lately that came dangerously close to that stop, but fortunately enough, I had it loose enough to avoid being stopped out. I can't guarantee I always will. The only thing I can guarantee is that you will have some losses, okay? So as you know, I like to temper everybody's expectations, and then longer term, they end up pleasantly surprised as opposed to sell some bullshit and then have them um, instantly depressed when things don't materialize because there is no holy grail. And you do have to work at it a little bit. Um, as a general statement, looser stops within reason will help you to catch more trends because 
A lot of times, like I said, you know, issues of back will fill. Let's say you're trading a pullback, it does this. A lot of times it'll do this and then take off, okay? In an ideal world, it would just take off and you'd have eternal sunshine. But if it, if it were that easy, everybody would be doing it, okay? Uh, again, not to beat the dead horse, but stops must be adjusted to the volatility of the stock. And it's better the devil you know. Um, as I think I've mentioned before, I've been working on a book for a couple years, um, one page at a time, every, you know, five, from 5.30 to 6.30 every morning, uh, or when, when time allows. But usually it's it's first thing in the morning, I write a couple pages and then um, do my other routine for the morning. Anyway, it's the lost art of stock selection because it truly is a lost art. And one chapter that I recently added to the book is called Better the Devil You Know. So you're much better off knowing that a stock is volatile and adjusting your position size accordingly as opposed to trading a less volatile stock and having some solstice, uh, is that the word I'm looking for, having some sort of uh, comfort in the fact that this stock is less volatile and less likely to get you in trouble. And, and in fact, it, it could be just the opposite because that, that black swan, I hate to use that term, but that black swan move, that large outlier move can happen and will happen. And if you're trading a decent share size or too big a share size when that occurs, you get in a lot of trouble. So my feeling is better the devil you know. Get into stocks that have demonstrated that they could move uh, significantly in the past within reason. Now, if it gets too crazy, if the HV is, let's say, well over 100, 150 or something like that, then maybe you don't want to do anything with that particular stock, unless there's a, a tremendous amount of structure to it and it looks like the mother of all setups. But for the most part, my feeling is better the devil you know, and I think you're much better off trading more volatile stocks than less volatile stocks, but adjusting your share size accordingly. Now, something bad can always happen to a less volatile stock, thereby creating a move much larger than the historical volatility would suggest. I wonder if i got to take that ass off that suggests. Uh, and this doesn't have to be anything to do with the company itself, business conditions or its competition. It could simply be something as stupid and as simple as an impropriety by the CEO. And that's what I've been preaching about. You know, the guy from HPQ goes out and um, how do I put it mildly? You know what he did. Uh, so, and the company lost, I think it was $12 billion overnight just because of a stupid a stupid, stupid thing to do. Uh, I guess his ego got the most of them or whatever, or something else got the most of them. So there's no safe haven in uh, lower volatility stop, stocks. Now, if you're in a gradual market and everything's kind of going along swimmingly, then maybe it's okay. But sooner or later, you will get whacked in lower volatility stocks. The other thing, too, to remember and I don't want to preach, I, make, I don't want to make this whole presentation against lower volatility stocks. But the other thing to remember is it's going to take you a lot longer to get a move, a decent move out of a lower volatility stock. So your exposure to the market is going to be much, much, much longer. Whereas you're looking at these little stocks we're trading, some of these IPOs, we got an 18% move in one day. So we got our profit target out fairly quickly. Um, and it might run up another 100%, who knows, but we are not likely going to be sitting in that stock for a long, 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 long time waiting for it to move. Whereas if you're in a low volatility stock and it just kind of grinds along, then it might take what months or years or whatever to get a decent move out of that stock. And during that time, something bad can happen, something, God forbid, uh, could could happen bad uh, nationwide or something. We could have some sort of market crash or some sort of, um, uh, you know, bad things do happen. I don't want to jinx us or anything. Uh, a dollar stop seems arbitrary. What if you support? What if you support a resistance and put stop based on that? Well, the dollar stop is not arbitrary because you are adjusting to the volatility of the instrument and you are using the structure of the instrument 
to set that stop. Okay, so if you're trading, let's say you're trading a transitional setup. So I'm doing exactly that, Howard. But a dollar stop is not arbitrary. You have to have a, do a dollar stop must be used on every position. You have to determine how much you're willing to risk. But let's say we got a, let's say we got a gatekeeper pattern or something like this, and we look to enter right here. Well, this prior high in here, we know if it gets past this prior high, we know we're in trouble with our position, which is supposed to go this way, okay? Or let's just say a bow tie, something a little bit more uh, common and more simpler pattern. We got a bow tie at a stock, and the stock drops, comes back, and we got a bow tie set up here. Well, we know if it comes back to this prior high in here, we know that we are going to be wrong in that position. So, yes, that might help us to set our stock, that plus the volatility of the stock. Now, every now and then, there's a chance where you could have a very tight stop. Let's say you have a market that does this, and it makes a witch hat. There's like an opening gap reversal comes back in. You might be able to put in a really, really, really tight stop right above that high, but you want to be careful and not go crazy and trade a whole bunch of shares when you do something like that, when you use that super tight stop. Let's say you played an opening gap reversal in the morning. Uh, we had a nice one a couple days ago, okay? Um, and you could go in and, and trade that, but you don't want to go in with like a full 2% position. Maybe you go in a much smaller position. So if you do get a chance where the market gives you that structure for a super tight stop, you don't want to go in with a full 2% position. But as a general statement, let's say you're following along on my trading service and I recommend a stock and I have an entry on it and all, and hypothetically in the portfolio, that's how we track it, we use 2% on every position, okay? So a dollar stop is not arbitrary, and we are using the chart, okay? Dave, what causes stocks not to take off as they eventually do? Market makers, hedge funds, why do they care that everyone gets F by them? I don't know. Um, and, and, you know, you'll make yourself crazy in this business if you try to figure out the whys, okay? Uh, sometimes the market doesn't move on your time frame. I like what... Um, what Tom McClellan said, and then um, I, I was talking with Tom the other day. I'm in his um, one of his forums, and um, he 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 gave me a second quote that was actually from his mother, uh, Marion, I think is her name, um, McClellan. She's um, she since passed, but uh, I don't remember exactly how she said it. I'll tell you what Tom said first. When you buy a stock, you're not only forming a relationship with the com with the company but you're forming a relationship with everyone else who's bought the stock prior to you, and Tom said those people will screw you. And then Tom's mother said that people, everyone's a market timer. People time their, their investments. They time them based on when they have money, when they don't have money, and then, as I often say, people get a divorce, and then they, have, they sell stocks because they got a divorce. So a lot of times people buy and sell stocks has no reasoning whatsoever behind it. Now, from a technical perspective, let's say you get into a stock that pulls back and then it starts flatlining. All that's telling me is that stock needed a little bit more time to consolidate. So let's say you get in the stock does this, okay, and then it looks like it's going to head off to the races and it just kind of sort of flatlines in here. But what do we do? I'll stop us down here. We don't worry about it. We don't do anything, okay? And as I often point out, my, my most famous example of this was uh, we got triggered into a grocery store. It looked like it was going to take off, and then it just went flat for two months. I'd say, I don't know how many, I don't know what percentage of my clients gave up. Probably 95% gave up when it went sideways for two months. But this was a very significant trend, so a, a little consolidation in here is not out of the ordinary. Not that you would want to buy this consolidation, but... You follow your plan once you're in a trade, and sometimes the market, again, doesn't move on your time frame. And this thing got bought out, so it was like a double overnight. Okay. Nate says, new book sounds great. Thoughts when it be finished? Oh, God only knows. Um, I was approached by a major publisher, and uh, when I presented it to them, they said, because uh, in the book I talk about the stock picker being a dying breed. <laughs> and they're like, you're right, stock picker is a dying breed. That's why we're... We're not really excited about publishing a book on um, stock picker. So, uh, I, if I if I self publish, God only knows when it'll be done. If I 
decide to go with a the publisher, then I'll be put under some kind of deadline to get it done. So um, part of me wants to be under, under deadline, and part of me just enjoys writing. So I have no idea, uh, Nate. But, um, you know, maybe you could help me prove some of it if you want, if you want to see it early. Uh, please clarify over what prior duration we calculate the volatility of the stock prior to entry. Well, the, okay. First of all, the first thing I use, or one of the things I use, is um, historical volatility, and I use 50 days on that. So it's um, the HV is 50 days, and that's just an indicator, okay? So that just gives me an idea of how volatile the stock is. So the HV, which is historical volatility, is 50 days. I have the formulas for Metastock, and I have the formulas for um, Telechart. In fact, if you Google the one for, if you Google the, either one of those, you'll probably end up the same one as me. Uh, one sec. So we, we're using a 50-day HV, and this is what I like to look at in the markets. That's, uh, let's see, that's one, two... That's two and a half months, two and a half months of trading days, okay? And the other thing I do is I simply eyeball the stock, okay? Well, just eyeballing this one, and I don't have my um, official ranges put up here or anything, but I could see that this is about five points or so, and, uh, you know, another three or four points here. So, and then it pulled back uh, about six or seven points here. So I know that even at eight points, I'm a little tight on that stop. And as we'll talk about in just one second, you can see we took some heat in here. I think I have that marked up on the following slide. So I'll get to that um, shortly. So number one, look at the HV. And I don't remember the HV of this stock, but if your HV is like uh, 150, it's, it's so wild and crazy, you probably just want to avoid it altogether. But if your HV is around 20 and the market's around 15, you know that it probably doesn't bounce around. Um, much compared to the overall market. And so I'm less excited about this as it would be something in between here and there, okay? And then I look at, again at the structure of the market and eyeball the recent trading. Now, a lot of you guys use average true range, and I agree. That's a great way of looking at it because that's what I'm doing empirically. I'm looking at a chart, and I'm seeing what the range is, and I'm adjusting my stop accordingly. So average true range is fine. The problem with that is what average true range are you using over how many days? And, and keep in mind that everything's very fluid and everything changes quickly. And if you get you start adjusting your stops too much to accommodate for the statistical volatility of the market, then your stops become super, super wide. They become too wide, and it becomes too difficult to trade. But uh, like Howard said earlier, absolutely, you're looking at uh, support, resistance, uh, and, and things like that to see where a stock should not go. Or, you know, whenever I get into a stock, where am I wrong is the first thing I ask myself. On, on how much heat uh, can I take on this or should I be willing to take on this? And then after what point would I obviously be wrong point-wise in the stock, okay? Don't ever worry about percentages. I never know percentage-wise where my stop is. I only worry about how many points away from where the stock is because you start looking at percentages, especially if you're looking at like a lower price volatile stock, you'll get, you'll get all stressed out. Oh, I can't risk 30% of the stock. Yes, you can. You adjust your share size down. How much is 30% risk on a stock on a $100,000 portfolio on a stop? Well, it's 2% risk, okay? It's 2%. You're risking $2,000. How much is a 20% stop risk, okay, on a, on a $100,000 portfolio? Well, it's 2% risk because you're risking $2,000, okay? And John, you know, John was saying, like, please clarify over what time frame. Your most recent time frame is your most important because volatility waxes and wanes, okay? So you might have an HV of 40 over the last 50 days, but over the last 10 days, 
that HV may have jumped significantly, okay? So make sure you eyeball that shorter term volatility to see what's going on, okay? <laughs> oh, thank you, Nate. Never proved to book before, but we're willing to help my limited experience, minimal experience. Yeah, I've got a couple of guys out there that are really, um, I guess, AR for lack of a better term. And man, they could they could find stuff that you never would imagine. Hey, Dave, I found a board Cala. You by using your methodology, you preached uh, this baby's up seventy percent in four days. Knock a wood. Thank you very much for all you have done. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Win. I think that's one of them we might be talking about in a little while. Okay, uh, it's um, uh, Henry says, what it's HB? It's HV. HV is historical volatility. It's also known in some corners as, or in some places known as statistical volatility. It's a statistical measurement of volatility. It only uses closing prices, and it's like a logarithmic day-over-day -day price, and, and I'm going to get myself in trouble if I try to pretend I know any more math than than I actually do, but it's it's a um, it's an annualized um, uh, method that of measurement that should put you if uh, if if the market was normally distributed, okay. So a 50-day HV of 20, and there's um, this market it annualizes that number out. So the market should be 20% higher or 20% percent cent lower a year from now, and that's a two-thirds standard deviation type of measurement. Don't worry about all that math. Just know that if one stock has an HV of 30, it's more volatile than the one that has 20. If one has one of 40, then obviously it's more volatile than one that has an HV reading of 30. Did not understand a previous comment about not entering kite full size at first trigger. Yes, you did. You enter the full size when it triggers. Okay, so you would put in 100% at this juncture here. Now, what I do when we get to the spreadsheet in a few minutes is I separate that out. I think it was 250 shares on the 100K account. I separate that out into two loads, okay? One is going to be a swing trade short-term trading loaf, and one is going to be a long-term trend-following loaf. Okay. How can I get HP formula for Metastock? Do not sell or not thanks. Do you sell or not thanks? No, I'll give it to you. It's free. Okay. Okay. Is that the 50 day HV? Oh, I don't know. We'll have to look at it. What do you have? Is that uh, HV for S&P? Well, when we get to S&P, we'll take a look at it. Looks like the entry was the bar before your highlight. Um, no, because we use a we use a liberal entry, okay? Because more a lot of times you'll get a lot of times. Let's say you know back in 1999, yeah, you want to get in like right here, okay? In fact, you might even want to try to get in sooner than that. But now you might want to give a stock a little wiggle room because a lot of times they'll rally up and then they'll die and you'll avoid a losing trade. So we give stocks a little bit of wiggle room to help avoid being triggered on nine alone, okay? I uh, just want to check my Ameritrade indicator. It gives yours. Just curious. I have 8.7%. For the S&P 500, no. No, that's too low. It should be around 15 right now. We'll take a look at it. Do you place actual stop orders when you're in a position? No. I tend to use mental stops. Uh, occasionally, I'll use what's called an airbag, or where I stole a term from uh, Trading Chaos, which is a book I would not recommend, but um, I have to give him credit because I think that's where that term came from, uh, where you use a much wider than normal stop in case I can't follow the screen. So at least I have a stop in place so I can live the fight another day. I won't like it. I won't be happy if it gets hit, but a lot more often than not, I'll be able to trade out of the position afterwards. Uh, if you are newer to trading and or lack discipline, then use hard stops. If you uh, can't watch a screen but if you are disciplined, uh, put alerts in. Maybe use contingency orders. I don't want to open up that can of worms too much uh, because each broker is going to have a different contingency order. 
but learn what your broker provides with contingency orders. A lot of times, a contingency order can can get you out of uh, keep you in good positions and get you out of uh, bad ones. Okay. How do you determine the value of wiggle room for an entry? Well, it depends on the volatility of the stock. And some of it is experience. Some of it is uh, how we were saying earlier. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, I said, okay, well, I got this bar here where it kind of faked out. So I probably want to be above that bar. And on this particular day here is when I first started seeing the setup. So I said, well, let me put it, let me give it enough room to where, you know, a point or two at least on this thing because it could move several points a day in case it wants to rally up and then die, okay? What about entries when, you, when you're not in front of the screen? Okay, okay, yeah, stop orders on those, okay? Absolutely. Many times I'll go for a walk and come back and I'll be stopped into positions. I don't want to stay at a screen all day, every day, okay? I love looking at charts, don't get me wrong, but if you look at charts too much, especially if you look at an intraday chart, and watching that quote feed all day, uh, sometimes, like, uh, what's his name said, uh, you end up wanting to feed the slot machine. I'm trying to think of who said that. Um, what's his name? Trend follower. Anyway, it, it, it'll come to me. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. You can just stop market entry. Okay. All right. Good questions, by the way. So again, wider the stop, your the less you're going to actually be risking uh, when you're looking at your percent of the account should something drastic happen. Okay, Richard Dennis? No, uh, Sakota. Thank you, uh, Steve Sakota. Interesting fellow, that Sakota guy. We saw him, saw him speak back in uh, March of this year um, at um, AAPTA conference. All right, we have a dead money report this week. Uh, in case you were wondering, it's the um, same stock we've been talking about so far all day. Uh, for those who don't know what dead money is, it's a slang term based on Investopedia.com for money invested in a security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. Okay. Well, if you do that, the position wasn't going to work, then just get out of it. But you don't know that. You don't have a holy grail. And if your reasoning going in was valid, then you stick with the position. Like I told somebody a while back, in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay? So we get in this position. On this trigger here, we got to stop here. Starts to rally up a little bit. I don't know. If, I don't think we adjusted the stop much because it didn't really do much. And then it comes right back in. What do we do? Nothing. Stock starts going sideways. What do we do? Nothing. Okay, stock rallies and hits the profit target. What do we do? Well, we take partial profits. We take off half here. And then we bump the stop up to break even, which is about right here. So if it comes all the way back in, barring overnight gaps, we have done what? We have captured a swing trade and we scratched out on the remainder of the trade. This is what the this is the actual live portfolio, FYI. So on that first low for the trade, we made 18%, okay? Which, like I said earlier, that's about the size of our original stop. So it seems like a lot, but then you could also make a lot, okay? You risk 18%, make 18%. But Dave, should you make more? Yes, hopefully we want to make a lot more than that on the second loaf. And uh, as of yesterday, it was up 23% on that second low. So, so far, the original profit target was eight points. So far, we're up 10 points and change. Okay, knock on wood, based on last night's portfolio. I think we were higher this morning, but then we gave it up a little bit. Okay, now, as I said earlier, you want to divide your position into two parts. Okay, uh, this is the, the, the trading low, which you're going to trade out of for a partial profit. And notice that it is white. Anything that's white, has hit the partial profit target, okay? Anything that is still yellow is still on, and in a case like this one, this UEC just hasn't worked out for us yet, okay? But we got, uh, let's see, one, two, three. Three out of four ain't bad for an open portfolio. I'll take that any, uh, any day of the week. Okay, any questions on 
stops or anything we talked about so far, volatility stops, money management, before we uh, shift gears here. And we'll, um, I'll plot the piece for you, Jonathan, and we'll see what the HV is on those. All right, good bunch today, by the way. Thank you guys for being here. Okay, um, the great bull market, IPO bull market of 2014. Here's some good news. It's not dead yet. We had a tremendous bull market, and for months and months and months, I've threatened to do a um, an IPO course, and then um, finally got around to doing it, and we had some wonderful blow-off type of moves, like right before it, IPO market kind of dried up a little bit, and then uh, fortunately, during some of the follow-up sessions, we caught some really nice uh, big winners. This is from the last follow-up session that I did. What I like to do is, if I do a course, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give the course, and then you get a lot of theory, okay, which is derived from a lot of practice. But at the time, it seems like a lot of theory. And then I'm like, all right, guys, now that we learn the theory, Let's go out and practice it, and that's why. And that's why I'll do these follow-up sessions, where we'll go out and we'll pick new stocks, and we'll see what happens. Okay. Sometimes it works beautifully. Sometimes it doesn't work so well. But lately, unfortunately, it's been working fairly well. Uh, back on the follow-up session on the 17th, we had VTAE with an entry of eight and a half, and you can see it came in right here. So so far so good. About a 250% run on that one. Uh, this one triggered a couple days ago for the very patient who were willing to wait for the breakout on this. Uh, as you'll know, I'm not a big breakout player, but in the IPOs, there are some breakout characteristics that can work very, very nicely. And uh, both of those are breakout patterns. So here's another one from the 17th. Um, this was one I found fascinating because like uh, two or three days after I gave my um, follow-up, this one actually came in and uh, triggered and set up and it triggered an entry. And so far, so good on that one. That's about a double on that one. And, of course, if you look at the open portfolio, this CTLT uh, is an IPO, and so is this kite that we've been talking about all day today. So, so far, so good. Uh, we also got stopped out of a few IPOs. Zen comes to mind is one of them recently. And uh, knock of wood, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the IPOs that we traded, uh, at least since the course, have all uh, have all been profitable. Now I'll probably just put a big jinx on everything, but um, is Cala classified as a bottle rocket? Um, we'll get to that in one second. Uh, keep in mind with IPOs, and this is one thing I was saying, and yes, I did a webinar yesterday, um, and if you want that. If you want a bigger version of that webinar for free, if you go to my IPO page, which I'll show you in just one second, there's a one-hour webinar there. And in that, I explained that we, we bend the rules a little bit, but we don't completely abandon the rules. And as I was saying yesterday, if all you did was take the core methodology, if you read Laban's and you follow along with these weekly – uh, courses or a week of charts, whatever you want to call these things that I do each week. I think you would do very well in the IPOs. And there's with the course, I took it one step further. There are some breakout characteristics. There are some things where we kind of bend the rules a little bit. Uh, bottle rockets are, are to be avoided in, a, in the core methodology in an established issue. But in IPOs, bottle rockets can often be tradable if they set up afterwards. So we'll get to that in one second. Um, right now I've got uh, $200 off on my IPO course, just an FYI on that. I was thinking about uh, that this morning. So if I sell like a dozen of these, I paid for my go to webinar. See all this webinars and stuff costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So this is uh, one way to recoup those costs because I enjoy doing this anyway. So it's kind of like I get it's, this is fun for me, but um, it is a cost. And, it, and, you know, you got to pay those monthly bills, and when you when they come in, you think, well, geez, do I really want to um, continue this? And the answer is yes, of course. But anyway, uh, with the IPO course, you're going to get access to the existing spreadsheet signals, uh, and those are things that I excerpted that you could see 
on these uh, particular charts like this right here. You'll get the entries for everything we discovered so far. And then you'll get, uh, there's one more follow-up session. So there's three hours of live follow-up, and that's been recorded. But there's one more live follow-up session, which I think I'm going to do next Friday. And from the looks of it, it looks like we'll get some um, some setups between now and then. And then there's four hours of intensive uh, trading. Oh, this is it right here, access to the last follow-up session. So far, these have been pretty good. We found uh, quite a few winners in these. I can't guarantee you that we will. Uh, it does kind of it is kind of stressful to to try to make sure I pull that rabbit out the hat. But looks like if unless things come unglued, you know, big if, right? Uh, it looks like we'll be able to find some setups again for um, next week. Uh, everything I do has a limited lifetime support, obviously within reason, but with uh, it also as it relates to the IPO course. So you can't – don't call me and ask, you ask me to help you build a trading system and program a trading system um, based on somebody else's methodology. That's not the type of support I provide. Uh, but if you want to know about an IPO five years from now when a company comes public, then by all means, call me, um, and I will support that. Okay. Uh, right now, 297. If you go to DaveLander.com, IPO dash course, or if you go to the store, uh, you will get um, you'll see the marketing page on that. And I mentioned the webinar. Uh, do go in and watch the webinar. 100%. Um, like I said, uh, money back guarantee for the first 30 days. And if you come here to the course, which I'm taking a chance on because you could. Um, there's going to be one bad apple out there that, that uh, takes advantage of the situation. Most of you guys, everybody here is a good guy. But if you look, uh, or girl, if you look in the middle of the page, there's the intro to IPOs. This is an hour and change, I think. So watch this first. And there's a lot of good information in that in and of itself. So there's a lot of free stuff out there. Uh, but there's, there, there's some other things that are important, too, uh, when it comes to, like, the breakout characteristics, knowing who the players are. And there's a lot more, uh, there's a plethora of knowledge on the IPOs. So check out that one-hour video first. If you like the video, you love the course. If you don't like the video, then don't waste your money on the course. <laughs> anyway, uh, sale ends on Monday, okay? Yeah, the course is recorded. The course is uh, already recorded. Uh, we, we did four hours. We did four hours back at, uh, I think it was July, uh, and then... We did three follow-up sessions, and there's one more follow-up session left. What I did was I spread those out over the last few months just so we'd see a variety of conditions. And right now I think it's a real good time um, to, to do that last follow-up session before the end of the year, uh, especially with these IPOs rallying like they are now. Okay. You mentioned something about algorithms. Um, yeah, algorithm, uh, I might have been talking about for your contingency trading uh, is the algorithms. And I'll explain that in one second. Uh, let me just wrap up the housekeeping. Uh, this offer is going to probably go at least until the end of the year uh, with the stock selection course, which is different from the IPO course. You'll get one year of my trading service uh, free. And, uh, you know, I might, be, I might feel generous between now and the end of the year and throwing the IPO course with that. So just kind of. Shoot me an email on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, algorithm meaning that um, let's say you want to put in a contingency order with your broker, okay? And you've got this uh, think, write your algorithm down like, okay, I want to buy if, it, if the stock is trading above, let's say, $20 a share, whatever your entry is. So let's say it's 20 And I want to make sure that the bid is also 20 and above to make sure it's a real market. So figure out what your algorithm is and then look at your brokerage contingency order page and plug that algorithm into that page, okay? So by algorithm, I just mean plan out what you want it to look at, look like in common English, in common terms or common English, and then translate in, into, um, into what your broker is offering, okay? Now, let's take a look. Uh, we're going to take a look at the overall market. We'll take a look at a few sectors in here, and then uh, we'll pop out for individual issues. And you guys can start asking, and girls can start asking uh, questions about individual issues, and I'll be happy to field those questions, okay? The first thing I want to do, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. And y'all will ask me about HV on that. The HV for 13 days is, I'm sorry, for 50 days is now 13, okay? 
and that's about right for the S&P 500. It's a little on the low side because we had this big drift in here as of late. In fact, let's talk about that drift. One thing I didn't like about this market was that it just was drifting higher in here. Okay, It sort of was off to the races. Notice it went straight up in here off those October lows, and then it just drifted sideways. So as I preach ad nauseum, you want a market to look like this. And if you go into stock selection course, that's one of the figures we talked about quite a bit. And that's the that's the momentum of the market. You want to see momentum increasing and not decreasing. So I didn't like this drifting action in the P's, but as I preached for quite a while, it's not our job to fight it. We just follow along. Now, I sort of like it now that we're getting some knockout moves in here. It is getting a little squirrely, and they never make it easy on you. And here's the beauty of what has happened here. We had this tailing action lower, and I wrote in my column, hey, I think it's TKO related. So this looked like a knockout move. It looked like it was almost textbook perfect. It looks like it's going to clear the way for the market to go higher. What happened yesterday? Okay, The market sold off hard. So what did that do? I got a lot of I got a lot of emails from people, not people on my service, and not people that are that are um, what's the word uh, big fans or followers of me. They they they're off doing their own little thing, but they, they you know we've met through the years and 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 I know these guys and they do their own thing, but they they kind of keep a loose eye on what I'm doing, and boy did I get some bearish remarks and boy did they give me a hard time for my columns not being bearish and talking about it being a TKO and all. And yesterday they were like, aha, look at this. This is the world. This thing's coming unglued. It, 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 boy, I tell you, if, you, if you let yourself get caught up in that, you really think that uh, the bear market started yesterday. But look what's happening today. We've come right back. So this is sort of like a, a fake out of the fake out. Okay, so the market – Faked out to the downside. Looked like it was ready to take off again. Bam! It gets hit again hard, and now it's turning right back up. Uh, a couple of adages I've gotten from Linda Rasky, and I asked her personally where she got them, and she said she probably got them off the floor, and she didn't really remember they being quotes directly from her, but I'll give her credit because that's where I got them. A market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most, and it will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, okay? And that's something you got to kind of wrap your head around. A market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. It's going to, if it's headed higher, and it's obviously still in an uptrend, it's going to have some shakeout moves. And then look at what it's done here on a micro basis. It had a shakeout TKO move two days ago. And then it looked like, nope, it's rolling right back over. And then today, nope, it's going straight back up. So just enough shake out in here to shake out some nervous longs and attract some eager shorts. I know for a fact yesterday attracted some eager shorts. And if you go back a few days in my column, you'll see that what I wanted to happen was I wanted the market to sell off just enough to – Shake out the Johnny Come Lately is the fast money. Those people who buy when the market's topping and attract some eager shorts. And that's sort of like along the lines or in the spirit of a TKO. And but I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. I didn't want to be taken out of my positions in the meantime. And luckily, we had uh, actually one, this, the one we were just talking about, the kite actually went on to make the profit target. So in spite of the market headed lower, we had a pretty good uh, couple of days in here. Knock on wood, it doesn't always work that way. But it's like I wanted to see some knockout action, but not enough to knock me out, too. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Uh, decent day there, too. We've made back almost all of uh, yesterday's losses so far. So, so far, so good. Uh, you know, here's the bottom line. Never argue with a market when it's really close to all-time highs, or in the case of the NASDAQ, it's about 14-year highs. So if you err on, side of the, err, err on the side of the trend and don't argue with a market that's at or near new highs, okay? Based on HV of 13, what's the lowest HV in a stock you would consider? 
Uh, I, you know, I tend to cut. I tend to stop. When I get much below thirty, I tend to just kind of speed through those down to twenty, and then I, I don't. I don't even dip below twenty. Um, and it's like I pointed out earlier. You're, you're first of all, and this is this might be a you write that down moment, or one of you write that down moments for this presentation. You're not going to beat the market with stocks that are lower in lower volatility than the market itself. Now I know there's some been some crazy studies that claim you could do that. But the, the only way you could do that is if those stocks expand in volatility, and that's what those studies are based on, okay? They're looking for those stocks to, to expand in volatility, revert back to the mean. That's a little bit more complicated lesson than I want to get into, plus it's not tradable. It's not a tradable system as far as I'm concerned. So as a general statement, as a trend follower, as a momentum player, you will not beat a market with stocks that are less volatile than the market. You need to be in the stocks that are moving and have proved that they can move and can move much greater than the market, okay? So NASDAQ coming back nicely in here, just shy of these 14-year highs. So far, so good there. Let's take a look at the Rusty real quick. Great questions, by the way. Great bunch today. This is the smartest bunch I think I've ever had in here, so congratulations, you guys. Um, Rusty coming back, not too bad today. It was down 2% yesterday, uh, up a uh, percent and a half today. Ideally, though, I would like to see it break out decisively. When a market begins kind of chopping back and forth like this, it does tend to wear people down. So hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll see a breakout soon. A couple areas in here looking questionable, like railroads have kind of broken down. The foods have pulled back kind of deeply in here. Very important for the foods to turn back up soon here, here they are you can see and they get a little bit of a bounce today um but for the most part most areas look pretty good drugs are at or near new highs drug delivery biotech is uh, begging out new highs yet here let's take a look at the ibb and see what's going on today yeah it's coming back nicely in here just shy of multi-year highs so without going through uh too many sectors for the most part most areas are looking pretty good Gold and silver are still in this bottoming mode, like I said uh, in my column the other day. I'm using the gerund there because I think it's still going to be a process rather than an event, and that's fine with me. I like a market that takes its own little sweet time and bottoms. Maybe if it even takes six months to a year. Like I said, uh, middle of June of uh, next year, it's probably when we'll see the bottom in gold, probably around noon, okay, in case you want to get it exact. But uh, so far, it's just kind of chopping around. Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm uh, joking about that. But it will, it will bottom out, or I think it will bottom out at some point in 2015, and we could see the mother of all trends from gold. Uh, ditto for silver, too. Silver's kind of just kind of bouncing along in here, and I think it eventually will obviously bottom out. Uh, what else is happening? I think that's enough for now. Uh, health services, another area doing pretty good, just kind of pulled back. Uh, Leisure's been doing pretty good for the most part in here. Um, what else? Utilities are losing a little bit of steam. You can see they've kind of going sideways. But most of these areas, as you go through them, you're going to see are at or near new highs and remaining in fairly uh, fairly decent trends. Most of technology, uh, semiconductors looking pretty good here. So, so far, so good for the most part. Retail looking pretty good. Just kind of pull back. In fact, look at retail. Bam, winning, breaking out to new highs today. Okay. All right, good questions coming in. Would you buy a stock with a lower HV than the sector's HV? Yeah, the, well, uh, that's a tough question. I never really thought about it. Um, I mean, you know, the sector would have to be a pretty volatile sector for me to do that. Uh, as a general statement, it probably doesn't work out that way. Probably the stocks I'm going to be in are the higher uh, volatility within the sector. Let's see what the biotech sector is. That would be a good one to look at, uh, biotech. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, as a probably not, yeah, because biotech is 23, okay? As a general statement, probably not, but if it was a small, like a uranium, yeah, absolutely, I'd buy a stock because uranium is going to have probably like an HV of 100. And maybe a stock will have an HV of 80. Like the UEC is probably something ridiculous. Let's see what it is. Yeah, it's 103. Uh, what are some of the other uraniums? URE or is it URE? 
yeah, 128, you know, so they're, they're just crazy volatile. But, yeah, as a general statement, probably not. I'm probably going to be in the higher, generally higher volatility um, areas within the sector. Could you read the bell on silver? This has been wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, Howard, you're trying to pick a bottom, and uh, no need to do that. You know, uh, as a trend follower, you're going to be a little late to the party. Silver, the commodity, though, has begun to shape up a little bit. you got a little bit of overhead supply here, but I would wait, okay? And um, you almost have a bow tie. If you can get to this overhead supply and this bow tie begins to cross over, uh, then, by all means, look to nibble on some silver stocks. But just, just take your time there, and don't be in a big hurry. I mean, that's one thing. You know, the beauty of me doing these weekly uh, webinars, or maybe not so weekly. I've been doing so many appearances lately. But uh, the webinars, the appearances, the writing, the teaching, all of these things help me to become a better trader. They also help me in that it, it gets me a little phil more philosophical, and, 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 and it helps me to – Understand fully what I do or more fully what I do, okay? I mean, you never fully understand markets, right? But it's like I know that I'm going to be a little late when this market tops. Um, in 2007, I, I kind of felt like that's one time in my career where I really knew the market was topping, but we had signals out the wazoo. I actually was apologizing to my clients because I couldn't find any longs to save my life, and all I could find was some shorts, okay? But for the most part, I'm going to be a little late to the party, okay, to the tread, and I'm going to get a little, I'm going to leave a little late, and I'm going to get there a little late, okay? So if this market begins to roll over, I might not have shorts on at the exact top, okay? I mean, we got one short on now, but you can't count that because that's left over from last time we were rolling over. So that's just how it works as a tread follower. And if you can wrap your head around that and realize you're a follower, okay, and not a predictor, your life becomes a lot easier. <laughs> Silver looks like a classic head and shoulders bottom forming. Yeah, I mean, yeah, why not? And, and here's the deal. Your right side is lower than your left. Now, I love classical technical analysis. Don't get me wrong. But you can get a lot of trouble if you're only using classical technical analysis. So... Yeah, notice you have a nice little, almost textbook, head and shoulders bottom forming, but don't get too excited until it breaks out above that neckline, until you get that first thrust buy signal, or until you get that bow tie buy signal, leave it alone, and just wait, okay? But yeah, I hear you, Phil. Phil's got a great eye for uh, reading the charts. Um, how big a pullback percentage-wise would shake out the weekends for low and PDCO, low. Uh, well, low is not a stock that I'd be very excited about trading anyway. Notice the HV is pretty low. But I hear you. It looks like it's it's done fairly well lately. Uh, you know, maybe about four points on this one uh, would probably be a decent pullback. Okay, it's a 60 something dollar stock. So four points wouldn't be that much. At least four points. So. Uh, just kind of, you know, kind of use your mind's eye. And that's what's kind of cool about some other charting packages. Um, you could actually write on the screens and all, and, and uh, ease more easily, I think, than, than telechart. But you could you could draw a bar in and say, okay, that's what a bar would have to look like. Okay, so that's kind of a fun thing to do. <laughs> Phil says, yeah, I think I owe you an email or two, Phil. I'm, I'm just a little behind. I'll catch up with you. Uh, Phil says, you don't have to be to say those nice things. I already signed up for another year. Thank you, Phil. I, I know you did. I appreciate that. Um, but Phil could, Phil knows what he's doing, so I'm, I'm impressed. Phil flies over here and gets continued education once a year, so that's uh, very impressive. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stocks, I guess. We kind of accidentally did. Um, TSRA. Uh, it's trending, but it's not set up. So you definitely want to have that in your uh, momentum list. And let me see if I got it in my Landry 100. Landry 100. Doo, 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 doo. And it, if, it, if you guys want a copy of these, um, I mean, not every day, <laughs> but uh, like after this webinar or something, that's fine. Just shoot me an email. I'll give you a copy of it. Uh, no, TSRA is not in it, but um, it should be. Okay. 
The problem lately with the with the list is a good problem to have. And this is this is the beauty of watching momentum lists and, and paying attention to momentum list is that lately I've been kicking out B plus type of stocks and then replacing them with A plus type of stocks. So this Tesla could go in uh, TSRA if it starts banging out new highs, it'll go it'll go into this list. It'll knock out a um, slightly weaker issue that still looks pretty good. I want to be like Phil, Marco. <laughs> uh, yeah, Phil's in the uh, UK, and he comes over once a year. He's in uh, Phil, you still in? L he's in the other LA. I'm in LA, and he's in LA. Okay. ALKS for Greg. ALKS. Um. You know, this one is definitely on my list, and I've been watching it, uh, but it hasn't pulled back quite enough just yet, okay? And let's see. The, the problem is it really hadn't cleared these prior peaks decisively. Um, but maybe if it pulls back a little bit, the shorter-term action here is much better looking than the longer-term action. So maybe a tiny bit more pullback. The only problem with that is you're pulling back into this prior little uh, peak. So, I mean, it's okay, and it's been catching my eye, but... Um, let me, mind, let me hide this list because you guys tend to pick off this list while you're in here. Back in London. Oh, two or three times. He comes to the States two or three times a year. Cool. That's awesome. Okay, DPLO. DPLO. Um, yeah, this was a this is an IPO. And uh I think it the it didn't quite fit the trigger back here because of uh the price of it. But uh, yeah, you know, if it could, at this point in time, you want to treat this more like a core position or the core methodology. So you want to see if it can continue higher, and then look to play a pullback on that one. Okay. ARDX. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one looks fantastic. Uh, super thin, no. Okay. Now with the, with the IPOs early in the process, we. Uh, we're willing to trade a more thin issue, but once they become more established like this, then it becomes very dangerous to trade. But yeah, this looks like a really good stock, okay? But super duper 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 thin, okay? So be darn careful. C A L A about a rocket. C A L A, did I get that wrong? C A L A about a rocket? C A L A. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, it's a sort of, but it, this one's already triggered as a uh, as the breakout. So the breakout, your official entry on this one would have been right here. Uh, actually, you had a, um, you might have had a, a prior entry on it. Uh, but yeah, now it's about a rocket. But the good news is it already triggered. Okay. Amag, A M A G. Um, this one's okay. Looks like I got it marked up from last week. A little bit more knockout maybe would be uh, better on that one. VWR, VWR. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. Um, you know, it is an IPO, and the run. My only problem is the run from here to here isn't that huge. Uh, cause we're trading really hot IPOs. Okay. And it's pulled back. So this one on Friday, if this one doesn't, I'm sorry, next Friday, if this one doesn't trigger, I might put this one, um, this one might be one that gets, um, uh, put in the, in the, um, spreadsheet as a potential trade. Uh, as it is now, yeah, it's, it's a potential trade, but I don't like, I don't feel like it's got enough, uh, momentum to it for a hot IPO type of trade at this juncture. So I'd like to see a little bit more that run from like 21 to 27 at six points. I mean, it's not bad, but I'd like to see uh, an even uh, more impressive one, okay? Just to clarify, after, pr after prior to days and stock being extended, you would not sell. Um, it depends on what the money management is telling us to do, okay? So let's say, let me see if I get a blank screen up here and draw it for you. I guess this screen will work. Um, 
let's say we took partial profits on this particular stock right here, and then it kind of went parabolic, par parabolic and started doing that, uh, we would not sell this stock out. Now, I don't want to open up a can of worms, but, I mean, if it went straight up, it went up 100% or something over a couple of days, then there's some things that you might you might could do. Uh, you could lighten up on the position a little bit. Um, you could do a crazy strategy like sell out um, and fritter away a portion of the proceeds and some and some options. But those options are going to be so darn expensive by that point. It's 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 a tough thing to do. So um, I'll know it when I see it, and it's 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 a good problem to have. But I can't give you a direct answer on that right away. But but, but no, the the official rule based on the core methodology is if you've already taken your partial profits for your swing trade, then all you have to do now is just kind of let that stop widen out loosely and let this thing do what it's going to do. Now, it might run up 100%, correct down 30%, 40% or whatever, then take off again. Your wide, wide stop might allow that uh, to happen, okay? Because, yeah, we had, like, uh, AGRX comes to mind. It ran up 100%, like, two days after getting in. And they came back and stopped us out within, like, the next two days. But we still got, like, 50%, 60% of the trade. Well, it's better than polka dot. You can't go crazy and, watch, and look at it and say, oh, it's up 150%. I want that 150%. Because if you take it tomorrow, you come in, then it's up 250%, you know. Um, but those are good problems to have, absolutely. Okay. Based on this, we shouldn't use lower price stocks to improve results of your systems. Um, I I like, well, I you know I'm okay with lower price stocks. It depends on how they set up. I mean, if you if you got a stock like the gold stocks next year, we're going to go after gold stocks, and they're going to be so beaten up, they're going to be at these low, 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 low levels. So when you see a study like that, there's they say like uh, he say this the there's a study that says the Lower price stocks outperform higher price stocks. Well, they're they're doing some big, broad, sweeping measure. It's kind of like when they when they did the lower volatility stocks performing higher volatility stocks. Well, what they were what they were ferreting out is an aberration where those low volatility stocks became higher volatility stocks, and those higher volatility stocks dropped in volatility. So that type of big picture, broad analysis, it's fun, it's educational. But I think it's academic at best. But yeah, I mean, I, I've, for instance, take a look at uh, SPWR. It triggered in 2013, I think, or 2012, 2013, I think, at five dollars and a half per share, and then it ran up to forty, fifty dollars a share. Okay, so that type of, uh, I forget, it might have, might have only been thirty something. I forget what it was, but. That type of six six hundred seven hundred percent move, yeah, that that makes your whole year, and that was a lower price stock. But that's not always going to happen. That's going to be more of the outlier that sort of um, confuses those statistics a little bit. But yeah, by all means, if I find I call it I call it a phoenix stock. You know, if I find a stock that um, that looks like this, let's say it was up at. I don't know, fifty, a hundred dollars, whatever you want to call it. You know, just some kind of ridiculous number way up here, and it comes down, and it bases for about a year or two, and then all of a sudden I see a little uh, bow tie, a little cup and handle, or some other classical technical analysis pattern combined with with uh, one of my patterns, like a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever. I'm all over this because this phoenix, I call it the phoenix stocks, may rise from the ashes. And uh, and take off again. Let me show you how bad I can draw here. Here we go. <laughs> when I was a kid, we were in an um, arcade, and, and uh, anybody remember Joust? We were playing Joust, and uh, we were actually waiting for some kids to get off of Joust, and there was an older kid in there. And um, the pterodactyl came out, which is uh, <laughs> has a P in it, right? <laughs> And so the the guy's like, watch out for the periodical. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it kind of looks like a little periodical I got drawn there. How do you set the partial profit target? It's uh, read the book, read Laban's guide. It's equal to the initial um, partial profit target is exactly 
the same distance to the stop. Okay, so let's say this is three, then this is three. But Dave, that's only one to one. Does it have negative negative expectancy? Uh, no, I did three shows on that. If you get the flash drives to the shows, there's a lot of good information in these shows. If I say so myself, I've, you know, knock on wood, I've never had a flash drive return. Everybody that gets them loves them. It's a lot of information. It's the most bang for your buck. In fact, I probably shouldn't even be selling them. Uh, but we covered that over a course of three shows, okay? And But, yeah, it's going to be uh, one-to-one. -one. So looking at that, uh, that little biotech kite or whatever it was, uh, what, what, where was our stop? Okay, if we could find it. It was eight points away, okay? Right here. Oops. Well, I'll show you in the spreadsheet. Even easier. Okay. So our stop was eight points away. What was our profit target? Eight points. Okay. So you make one to one in the first loaf, and hopefully one to some multiple of that on the second loaf. Like on this one right here, you can see initial profit target. We actually exceeded it here. So Instead of making a thousand bucks, we actually made uh, twelve eighty-seven, and then so far eighteen hundred on a remainder. So you want to catch that big longer-term trend because that's where the money is. Okay. All right, we got a lot of stocks stacking up. Let's get them. Let's see if we can get to them all. K and X for Mr. James, and uh, a couple other people want K and X too. James and John and who else? Uh, let's do it. That's going to be a shipping company. No, that's going to be a trucking company. This will be Knight, right? K and X. Uh, and that's one that I've seen. I just can't get that excited about a trucking company. Hang on. K and X. K and X. I'm almost dude out. It looks okay. We've got a minor gap down in here. I wouldn't get too excited about that. I'm going to give that one an okay. Okay. Um... I'm not crazy about trucking companies. HV a little bit on the low side, but not too, too low. Um, I'll give that one an okay. Heather wants to know about EW, or she's saying you to my presentation. Yeah, uh, great eye on identifying a trending stock, but it has to pull back, okay, before you look to play it, obviously. Nike, I'm probably not going to like. Heather's also asking about Nike. Um, yeah, it looks better than I thought it would. Nike's a big, thick stock. Tends to chop around a lot. Uh, HV 16. So it doesn't really, it moves, and I hear you, but it just doesn't move around enough for me to um, get excited. But although I have to admit, it has moved more and more recent times. But, yeah, this would not be on my radar because the HV is too low. I hear you, though. I can't argue with it. Now, sometimes these stocks will come on my radar because when I sort for my momentum list, when I'm putting my stocks in my momentum list, I my prerequisite is the stock has to make a new high, ideally on an expansion of range. So I don't worry about the HV. I'm looking for stocks that are making new highs, ideally an expansion of range. And sometimes I'll get some lower HV stocks into my momentum list. Um, but for the most part, I do tend to pick the higher HV stocks to go into the momentum list. But if all I'm left with is like a Nike and a Nike's making new highs like it was back here, then I'll go with a Nike. Um, I would rather, let's take a look at the report here. Um, and I might be a couple days behind in putting the symbols in. But I would rather, let's take a look at the percent change here. AGIO is up 90%, uh, okay? So let's take a look at AGIO, okay? And you can see, you see the difference between that and like a Nike, okay? It's already up 90% from where I put it in. Uh, for Nike to go up 90%, that might take five years, okay? But this thing is up uh, another 9% today. Let's take a look at the real time on this. And let's see what the real time moves are. Okay, and this is a, this is going to be uh, this is going to show you what happens with uh, with volatility. I mean, look at these moves in here. Okay, nine percent. Uh, this one's up five percent. Uh, we had one just the other day that went in 
that went up 60 percent uh, blue in fact right here so that's that's a testament for momentum okay you think it's high at one point and then it goes even higher okay and that's one of our big winners in, in the momentum list at least ALDR Yeah, that looks good. Um, that looks real good, uh, it, it, you know, on a pullback, okay? Uh, this is one that triggered as an IPO way back here, okay? And then this is what I call the fly and die. Uh, they tend to fly and then die out. And and it doesn't quite fit. There's a pattern I also call the what I call the fly, the slide, and the glide. The big picture pattern looks like that, okay? And it doesn't quite fit that pattern, although because it retraced a little too deeply. Uh, but yeah, on the next pullback, this this should now be treated more like a core methodology setup. So you're looking for those pullbacks or something like that. XNPT, Xenopoint, PT, Xenoport. Okay, yeah, this one looks fantastic. This is um, look, it's right here. Bam, I got it on my list. Okay, um, so yeah, that's definitely on my list. It's definitely on my radar. See, I never know whether you guys are coming up with these on your own or picking from this list. But either way, it's cool. Uh, yeah, but it needs a little bit more pullback, okay? But if you're long, stay long by all means. AAVL on a pullback. AAVL. Yeah, why not? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a no-brainer. That one, after today, if it's not already on my list, it should be. Uh, it should go on my list today. See, that's the kind of stock that's going to come into the list. Oh, a little bit too thin on volume, though. Take that back. So I, I couldn't put that in this list. Every now and then I make an exception in case you see something there. It's a little thinner. All right. P-R-A-H for John. P-R-A-H. Um, it's a new issue, but it doesn't fit the IPO methodology because it came um, because the trigger. Let's see. I don't give anything away. Yeah, the trigger was above a threshold, so it would actually have to break out the new highs and then pull back for me to uh, to trade that one. O V A S, O V A S. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. I mean, this is one that will probably show up at a momentum list. A little bit on the thin side, so be careful. But it's got somewhat adequate volume. H A B T. And I'm going to go to some of these people that have been waiting the longest. Uh, so if you you've been waiting, um, yeah, this was this one came public at high levels, so it's going to have to follow through and then on a pullback. Okay, um, PDCO. Yeah, on a little bit more of a pullback. Uh, it is a little bit lower in volatility though. It's got an HV of 15. Uh, one aberration of volatility is persistency, and it has been persisted. So I would say, yes, on a pullback, this one could uh, could work, but it needs to be a little bit deeper pullback. Uh, these people in here are feeling that eternal sunshine, that it just goes up forever, so you want to see a little bit um, of a knockout, okay? Uh, yeah, Henry, I think I answered that already. The course will be recorded, the IPO course. Uh, everything's been recorded up until now, and then uh, next Friday when I do the follow-up session, I will record that too. Okay. Uh, in case you can't make it, and again, if you ever need um, any uh, follow-up information, you know where to find me. CLDT, CLDT for Heather. Uh, yeah, it, this is trending. It's a REIT. I'm not a big fan of REITs, but I've got a few in this list here. Um, in fact, this one actually look right there. It's actually in my list. Okay, so. This is the beauty of this list, and I wrote a whole chapter just on, on maintaining this list. And we talked about this list a lot in the stock selection course, and that's where the chapter came from. Um, it forces you to do things that you might not want to do. Like when airlines are making new highs, it forces me to put airlines into this list, okay? And it forces me to look at things that I might not normally look at. Minimum requirement for 50-day average volume. Uh, I use 30-day average volume, I think, the most. 50-day average volume, just the same thing. It doesn't really matter. You could use 30 or 50. It doesn't matter that much. Um, ideally, 250K uh, volume or more, okay? DDC for Mr. John, DDC. Um, needs a little bit more pullback. 
And you know, it's my question is how can a metal in mining be uh, outperforming the overall sector? Hey, look, got it in my memory list. That's pretty cool. Derm, Derm, I think is one that uh, triggered from the IPO webinar. Uh, and I think that it is actually triggering today. It's triggering as a breakout, okay? Uh, a little crazy, a little thin. Be careful if you go after it. But, yeah, it's it's definitely um, – I can't pull up the list, but I think it's on our list, and it does trigger. It could trigger – based on the action today, it could be a long. depends on where it ends up today. It, but, yeah, it's in the process of possibly triggering. Phil wants to know about VA. Uh, well, I'm not a big fan of um, these big companies when they come public, like a Virgin Airlines or whatever. But um, I don't know. I mean, it could have. I'm not going to trade the breakout here. For me to get interested in this one, because it came public at higher levels, it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back. DDC is diamonds. Yeah, okay. That's what I figured. Might, might have something to do with Christmas or something, a seasonal type of trade. Uh, but, yeah, Virgin Airlines, VA, it's going to have to break out decisively and then maybe look to pull, play a pullback along the way. RCPT. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with this big old gap in here, but I hear you. Um, it needs a little bit more knockout to it, but I hear you. I can't certainly can't argue with that one. AXTA. 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 Uh, yeah, um, but it's going to need a pull back, okay? It's trending. Um, it doesn't have that breakout characteristic because it's a higher-priced IPO, but I hear you. I want to pull back, though. Uh, Habit, H-A-B-T, did we do that one? H-A-B-T. Uh, yeah, it's going to have to follow through to the upside and then maybe on a pullback. What was the HV for the S&P 500? I think 15. And let's take a look at spiders too. Yeah, 13 for the S&P. Spiders should be thereabouts. Yeah, 13. NASDAQ, uh, 15. NASDAQ's always gonna, usually always going to be a little bit bigger. Is this pullback too much? DTSI and PACE. DTSI. Uh, not too much for this one, but too long, okay? And this is where we bend the methodology a little bit with, uh, like, the IPOs. We'll look at some IPOs that have pulled back a little bit longer, but um, yeah, too long in that I, in that in that uh, roll. Uh, I said rollover. The reason I say rollover is by the time it's pulled back several weeks like this, you you one has to wonder has it lost steam. Notice you're moving averages. Uh, at least the 10 is turned down and the 20 is beginning to turn down and beginning to converge on here. So um, I will leave that one alone. And then what's the other one? Pacey. Now, Pacey a little bit different. Pacey, Pacey looks like a good setup because uh, it just kind of pulled back in here. It's not too many days in the pullback. That one looks okay, uh, Heather. So I would say that one over that other one. LB, is that Lumber Liquidators? No, LB is something else. L Brands. Yeah, on a pullback. I mean, you got a nice um, persistent trend there. Absolutely, on a pullback. Absolutely. Okay, John, we cover that one. Okay, we cover Pacey. ARDX. Yeah, this one's okay. Again, we talked about this one a minute ago. Super thin, but, yeah, it looks fantastic. Uh, nice little thrust higher, a little pullback in here. Nice breakout. Uh, you know, treat it like the core methodology. Uh, super, 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 super thin, so be careful. You're welcome, Heather. Okay. SWKS. We'll probably have to wrap things up in about uh, two seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's trending uh, on a pullback, though. It's going to have to pull back. Okay. ARDX. Uh, yeah, we talked about this one. We keep This one keeps coming up. We've got like six people asking about it. Cool. That's uh, You guys are uh, you guys are really smart. CLDT. Yeah, I think we need to go ahead and wrap things up. Yeah, on a pullback. It is a REIT, though. I think we talked about this one earlier. Yeah. Okay. Look, uh, you know, we're right about the time we need to uh, wrap things up because the recording size gets a little out of hand and too big to manage. Um, I, I love doing these shows, as you can tell. I have a blast doing them. Thanks for showing up. We appreciate it. Uh, I hope I didn't bitch earlier too much about the cost, but um, that's okay because I know that um, 
will recoup those costs, right? And I won't have to worry about my uh, my go to webinar will be paid for next year, right? Uh, anyway, kind of I'm kind of half kidding, uh, but anyway, everyone uh, have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, uh, anything I mentioned that you want Landry 100 list, or if you want some patterns that I mentioned or something, shoot me an email. I've got a lot of good videos um, on a lot of this stuff, so make sure you join my YouTube channel. Uh, when you check out some of those videos and I'll check out those articles um, under education. Anyway, uh, everybody have a great day. Have a great weekend. We don't talk again, and hopefully I'll see everybody again uh, next week. Thank you so much.